I refer to this presentation as Occupy Electoral Reform for the 99%. Can we engage the 99 in national and provincial decision-making processes by reforming our electoral system? And can we devise a reformulated electoral system that will truly empower the 99%? We will only discover the answers to these questions if we explore the possibilities and find the courage to make changes. And we must, because in the recent Canadian federal election of 2011, the Conservative Party won a majority of seats with less than 26% of the eligible voters using our first-past-the-post electoral system. In reformulating our electoral system, there are four topics that are particularly urgent. These four topics will become a major part of serious conversations in the hundreds of venues where Occupy Wall Street is being expressed. My first topic is election of members of parliament. For people from all walks of life to have their voices heard, their hopes expressed, and their desires counted in the national and provincial decision-making processes that affect everyone's well-being. It is necessary that our electoral system become more inclusive, whether or not it will be accomplished using single transferable vote or mixed member PR. Some system of proportional representation is necessary to enable the diversity of voices in Canada to be heard and considered. So, where proportional representation is used in an election, then the number of votes that a party receives overall, for example, 15% of the popular vote, is reflected in the number of seats that party will occupy in the parliament. That is, 15% of 308 seats is 46 seats. In the recent election, the Conservative Party won 53.9% of the seats with only 39.6% of the popular vote which was less than 25% of the eligible voters. A common outcome of proportional representation systems is that no single party wins a clear majority. Without a clear majority for a single party, all legislation must be thoroughly examined and debated according to the perspectives of the different parties. This often means that parties must cooperate in order to craft legislation that enhances the well-being of all. Cooperation amongst and within peoples of different experiences, different cultures, different perspectives is the critical next stage in our social evolution. In a mixed member proportional representation system, members are elected in individual ridings based on a first-past-the-post system in order to make the number of seats proportional to the overall number of votes a party received, additional members are chosen from a list created by the party. Such a list can be populated by the party decision makers choosing the candidates before the election, or it can be populated after the election. In this latter case, the chosen members will be determined by having received the greatest percentage of votes in their riding, although they did not win in their particular riding. A single transferable vote system enlarges the ridings so that there are between four and seven parliamentary seats being contested in that riding. As an example, in a riding where there are six parliamentary seats to represent a large riding, each voter will be entitled to cast six votes and will do so in order of preference for the candidates contesting those seats. Each of the parties may field six candidates in this riding, and there may be two or more independent candidates. In this particular system, the ridings are very large, and some may find it awkward to form a sense of personal connection with their representative in Parliament. On the other hand, this system tends to make the members of Parliament more responsive to the electorate rather than to the party leader. This latter occurs because there may be several candidates 
from the same party contesting those seats, which then makes the Prime Minister or Premier more accountable to the elected members of his or her party. The frequency of elections will be fixed. Four years seems like an appropriate term of office for each electoral cycle. This would encourage the parties to negotiate, perhaps even compromise, to make the system work effectively. It may occasionally necessitate choosing a new leader of the government for the balance of the fixed term. In exceptional circumstances, the election date may be changed with a 60% majority of Parliament approving an early election. My second topic is selection of members of the Senate. It is in the selection of members of the Senate where we will find the most radical reformulation of our electoral system. The numbers and boundaries of the Senate ridings will be different than those for the Parliament. In determining the boundaries of each of the Senate ridings, consideration will be given to urban and rural populations, eco-geographical features, as well as historic and social groupings. There will be quotas for male, female, and Indigenous members. The process for selection will be patterned on the successful approach created to choose members of the Citizens' Assembly, which was established to examine electoral reform in British Columbia in 2003 and 2004. Briefly, the selection process is as follows. From the voters list in each Senate riding, the names of 100 males and 100 females will be randomly chosen to receive an invitation to attend an informational meeting. Those who agree to serve as a member of the Senate for a period of six years will place their names in a female hat or a male hat, respectively. Out of each of these hats, one name will be picked to be the member of the Senate for that riding. Ultimately, there will be two females and two males sitting in the Senate to represent each riding. The selection process will be staggered so that it occurs every three years to replace one male and one female. Thus, for the following three years, two members will have had experience serving in the Senate and two new members will bring fresh ideas and enthusiasm. A similar process of selection will be applied to ensure that Indigenous populations of both genders are appropriately represented. The purpose of this Senate will be to apply sober second thoughts to the legislation created by the Parliament. The Senate may return the legislation with suggestions to the Parliament for reconsideration. Ultimately, the Parliament can impose acceptance of the legislation on the Senate. Notice that the members of the Senate are not retired politicians are not chosen by our political leaders at the time and are not being rewarded for past services. The pools of 100 persons from which a member of the Senate is chosen consist of ordinary Canadians from all walks of life with different skill levels and experiences and these Senators are only beholden to their fellow citizens, you. My third topic is financing elections. The financing of candidates and political parties would be done exclusively on a publicly funded basis. A democracy surcharge would be levied on each taxpayer every year. This would be done with the filing of income tax on an annual basis in the form of a $10 democracy surcharge. All campaign financing would come from this fund called the Canada Democracy Fund. Each and every candidate would be eligible for the determined amount of campaign financing irrespective of past electoral performance or party affiliation. Any political party fielding candidates in more than 60% of the ridings would be eligible for party administration funding. Expenses would have to be filed by each candidate and those documents would be subject to audit. To be eligible, 
Each candidate would submit the nomination form containing a fixed number of signatures from registered voters in that riding. The number of signatures required might range from 500 to as many as 1,000. Here, the intention is to discourage frivolous candidates from claiming election expenses. In Canada, an average of $92,000 was spent by each candidate in the 2011 federal election. In that election, there were about five candidates running for office in each of 308 ridings. If there were a total of 22 million tax returns filed in 2010, then a democracy surcharge of $10 per return would almost pay for the candidate's funding in a single year. If the democracy surcharge were assessed every year, then during the four years between elections, sufficient money would be accumulated to pay for all the election expenses, including the public funding of candidates' campaign costs. In the financing of elections, donations must be constrained. The only assistance that volunteers can donate to political parties or candidates would be in the form of time and effort. Party members and volunteers could be fully engaged in answering telephones, delivering flyers, knocking on doors, and other similar activities. There would be no other source of funding, be it financial or in kind. That prohibition would include individuals, corporations, unions, associations, and sources from outside the jurisdiction. The purpose of creating a public funding format and prohibiting outside contributions would be to level the playing field for all political candidates and to free the elected members of our governing bodies from any sense of obligation to special interest groups, merely because such groups have funded the candidate's campaign for election. My final topic is transparency. The candidates that we elect to our parliament represent all citizens and residents of our country. We elect and pay for our parliamentarians to represent us and act as our agents in a contractual and administrative sense. By analogy, when we hire a lawyer to represent us in negotiations with other parties, we expect that our lawyer will represent our best interest and keep us informed. We would not find it acceptable for our lawyer to tell us that he or she would not inform us of the nature of the discussions, the terms that are being traded, or the compromises being offered. We would also want to see the final draft of the agreement. We would expect all of these things before signing the contract. Similarly, I suggest that we, the people, who have elected and hired representatives can rightly expect the same level of accountability and transparency as we would receive from our lawyers. Any exceptions would have to be clearly delineated and accepted by the Parliament with a 60% majority before commencing negotiations in camera, both nationally and internationally. There are several additional areas where our electoral system would benefit by significant alterations. The following subjects will need to be elaborated as we proceed, but briefly they are number one, gender balance, at least in the Senate. Number two, Aboriginal representation, again at least in the Senate. Number three, urban and rural representation. Both populations constitute important parts of our social, innovative, environmental, and agricultural composite that makes up Canada. It is important to hear the perceptions and opinions of all groups. Number four, mandatory voting. Each person voting in the most recent previous election will be credited with $5 on the income tax return. Number five, constituency boundaries. These will likely be altered in both the Parliament writings and the Senate writings. Consideration to be taken into account will include population, political history, 
and eco-geographical congruence. And finally, number six, voting machines. These machines will be programmed to read paper ballots, calculate the distribution of votes, and provide a summary of the results quickly and accurately. The algorithms that power these machines will be open source and thus available for experts from all parties to examine the workings therein. In addition, because they will be reading paper ballots, there will always be a paper trail to reconcile any differences or conflicts.